My journey began here at the Bonvinai refugee camp in Thailand. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> Sorry about that. We had some technical confusion, but welcome. My name is Lori Barrientos Sanchez, and I'm the director of operations for Busboys and Poets Books, and my pronouns are they, them. It's been a tough year with COVID-19, but we are so excited to be able to connect with you all again virtually. Today, I have the honor of introducing you all to Cal Kalia Yang, she, her, a Hmong writer who calls Minnesota home. She has written numerous books, stories, and essays, including The Late Homecomer, A Hmong Family Memoir, The Most Beautiful Thing, and of course, Yang Warriors. Also here with us tonight are Billy Tao, he, him, Hmong American illustrator of Yang Warrior, who also calls Minnesota home, as well as Busboys and Poets bookstore supervisor, Kevin Zambrano, he, him. Yang Warriors is a beautiful story about hope, resilience, and compassion and young Hmong children who call a refugee camp in Vietnam home. We learn more about a small group of cousins who call themselves the Yang Warriors. And when times get tough, they follow the call. But that call doesn't come without danger. But we'll learn more about that in a little bit. First, let's dive into the illustration process behind Yang Warriors with the video you saw a little bit of narrated by Billy himself. Center for Hmong Studies at Concordia University. My journey began here at the Ban Vinai refugee camp in Thailand. Center for Hmong Studies at Concordia University, St. Paul introduced me to these magnificent photos. Because I was not born or been to the refugee camp, I don't know what life was like there. And also, it was closed in 1992. So I had to use my imagination. I imagined what the earth would feel like beneath my feet. The hot weather on my skin. The orange dust that enters my nostrils and exits black and what it's like to be a fierce and brave child within the camp. The ne next step I took was to read. I read a lot of books. I read books that gave me inspirations. I read on the Hmong history, I read biographies, I read fictions, and of course, I read children's books. In addition, I found inspiration from the old masters like Caspar David Friedrich, Gustave Corbet, Tyrus Wong. and Bandao, a traditional Hmong textile art found within the Hmong culture. With the assistance from the University of Minnesota Press editor, Eric Anderson, I created a storyboard and a book dummy to get a sense of the rhythm and emotion of the story. I created 
did some watercolor concepts, and I explored the interior and the exterior of the camp. I made a lot of sketches of people, animals, trees. I played with colors and I designed characters, making sure the clothes they wore and the hairstyle fits that particular period because I want to be truthful to the story. Once I felt confident and prepared, I began the illustrations. Every night, I took notes and looked over my illustrations. Sometimes, if I need help, my nephew Owen helps by being my model. For a particular illustration, I would make sketches over and over until I felt comfortable or the result I visioned is right. Then I'd finalize the illustration. Within this journey, the Ying warriors demonstrated many valuable tra traits of a warrior. They showed me heroism, bravery, sacrifice, persistence, compassion, and hope. The Ying warriors showed me that resilience is not only standing back up after you fall, but returning to the state of mindfulness. Not looking back into the past, nor forward into the future, but concentrating on what is important right in front of you. It can be anything. For me, it was you. Hello folks, quick apologies. We understand that the video was a little choppy, so we will replay it at the end for everyone so you can get the full beauty of it. And now, without further ado, I am going to pivot it over to Kalkalia Yang herself so that we can do a live reading of Gang Warriors. Hello everybody. Thank you so much to Busboys and Poets for having us. One of my favorite memories of starting out in the children's book um, journey started out at Busboys and Poets, actually, meeting with other children's book authors and, and the editor of my debut picture book, A Map Into the World. Today, I'm super excited to share A Yang Warriors with all of you, um, illustrated by Billy Tao, whose journey you've gone to see via the video and who will be a part of the conversation that we'll have after the reading. Um, thank you for joining us in celebrating Hmong American Day from Minnesota. And of course, Asian Pacific Islander uh, Month has just passed us by. So thank you. Now I'm going to try to do a screen share. Um, and I'm going to And I'm going to try to read, um, show you the PowerPoint of the book as I'm reading along. Can you all see it? Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna try to read along and then do the screen share. I want to make sure you all can see the images before we start. Um,
I think you all can see me now, correct? Okay, let's try to do this. Yang Warriors by Kao Kalia Yang, illustrated by Billy Tao. Ban B. Nai Refugee Camp, 1986. Hello again, folks. Hang on with us. We're having some technical difficulties. As you know, in this world where technology is where we do everything, it always wants to go just wrong when you want it to do exactly what you want. And we are going to go ahead and so. Go ahead and, and we're going to get this set up for you guys because we want you all to see the lovely illustrations. And now we are going to share screen, share screen, share. And here we are with Yang Warriors, and we are going to give it just a second for Kalia to join us again. If we could get Kalia on audio, please. Hello. For our money. So unfortunately, Kalia has disconnected. And right now we have Billy with us. He's going to go ahead and do the live reading for us. Thank you so much, Billy. And I'm going to yeah. go ahead and do the pages with you. So 
Sure. There we go. Sure, and perfect. Lori, Lori, just to make sure, you can can you hear me? Can you yes. hear me well? All right, perfect. Yes, yeah, so I will substitute for uh, Kale right now and do the reading. Uh, so I just want to give a little quick introduction of who I am. So I am Billy Tell, the illustrator. And so right now, Kale is not with us. So I will be doing the reading uh, for us on Yin Warriors. So let's get started. Yin Warriors, written by Gao Kalia Yang and illustrated by me, Billy Tell. <clears throat> Bun V9 Refugee Camp. 1986. Above the television set, in the dark room, the legendary heroes rose. The bald monk, mobilizing his energy, the honorable warrior facing his enemies, the brave woman with her sword at the ready, the children set with wide eyes and open mouths. As soon as the credits started, they raced outside to practice. In a clearing between the houses, the children bowed to their elected leader, a 10-year-old cousin named May, the Hmong word for little. Master May was tiny. Though his arms and legs were small, his belly was round and set on his middle like a bull. He had been chosen because of all the cousins in the camp. He cared the most and believed the fiercest that the children were powerful warriors. Master May acknowledged their bows with a slow nod of his head in each direction. The children knew he would not leave any of them behind. Hello everyone, I'm back. Thank you so much, Billy, for leading the reading. Um, Let's take turns doing this, Billy. You and I have not read this book together, so. Sure. Um, we are on, okay, the children. The children saw the enemies that existed everywhere, the guards with their guns. They practiced the art of throwing rocks and thrusting sticks, the other refugee children looking for play space. They held each other by the waist and kicked the air, the lonely ghosts waiting on the other side of the fence. They ran drills, running fast in one direction and then the other, so they could confuse and outsmart. They had all heard the ghost stories, people who had died because of broken hearts or aching bellies, people who had left behind loved ones and were hungry for a return to friends and family. Billy, will you read the next page? Yes. There were seven boys and two girls in the group. All of them were younger than Master May. Each morning, at the crow of the roosters, the pot belly boy stood at the ready, lines drawn into the dirt of the camp yard. The children arrived one by one, each with a flat rock in hand. They went to the lines and balanced the stones on their heads. When their shadows disappeared beneath the noon sun, they ran to a different homes for meager lunches of rich balls and dried fish. After lunch, they resumed their practice. The sticks in their hands were sacred swords. The children engaged in mental battles. Master May chose a pair of kids and the others stood in a circle around them. The chosen ones bowed. They sat cross-legged on the dirt, eyes tightly closed, backs rigid, and sent their warrior spirits into the space between them. The sun's heat traveled through their hair and clothing until sweat beaded their brows and dripped off their chins. The mental matches lasted from minutes to hours. The winner was the one whose concentration and stamina could not be broken. Finally, Master May said, well done, disciples. One especially hot week when camp rations were thin, Master May took a seat alone in the circle of the group. He closed his eyes and meditated. After an hour, when the youngest member of the group a five-year-old named Ong sank on her knees from exhaustion. He opened his eyes and said, we must leave the camp to forage for greens. The younger children needed it. The words were dangerous. Everyone knew the rule. No Hmong person could leave the camp without permission from the Thai guards. The children had seen man and woman beaten for leaving the camp. 
people had disappeared after reports about their leaving had been filed. Each child drew in a breath and held it, waiting for Master May to clarify his vision, to speak of something else. But his shoulders were stiff, and his eyes were far off as he explained. There is a farmer with a pond full of morning glory nearby. If we are caught by the authorities or the adults, I will fulfill my destiny as your master. I will take all responsibility and bear the punishment. I was a scared child, comforted by the pillow of my mother's arms, the hold of my father's hand. I was not a member of the group. My older sister, Dao, was one of the two girls. She was seven years old then, a small girl with thick, messy hair, one leg shorter than the other because she had polio as baby. Her job in the group was to carry everyone's flip-flops if they were in a fight and flee situation. She was also the best at the mental battles. The night before the secret mission was hot and humid. A layer of dark clouds had gathered beneath the full moon. In our bed, Doug kicked her legs restlessly. When the songs of the crickets and the snores of our father were the only sounds in the room, Doug whispered, tomorrow might be my last day. I whispered back, why? Her voice was low and serious. Tomorrow we are going on a mission. I asked, where? We are leaving the camp to look for food. I couldn't find enough air in the room to breathe my words. You can't. Dao said, Master May believes it is the only way to save you and the younger children. You haven't had vegetables for weeks. I said, I don't even like vegetables. Besides, you'll get in trouble. The guards might kill you. She swallowed, then said, if we don't come back tomorrow, tell mom and dad where we've gone. At first light, we set out. Long after Doe fell asleep, I could not. I listened to the sound of my scurrying, watched the light of the moon through the slits in the walls. The next morning, when I woke, the bed was empty. My mother had left to tend her small garden of cilantro and green onions. My father was out carrying the daisy's water from the well. I looked at my sister's place beside me, and I knew she was not in the yard, standing at her line. I put my hands over my quivering belly. I watched the adults prepare lunch. My father blew into the red embers of last night's fire until a small flame danced among the burnt wood. My mother smashed chilies, green onions, cilantro, and salt in the mortar and pestle. They were thin, their faces tired. I knew they were probably hungry and scared too. Each time I closed my eyes, I saw the end of the battle scenes from the historical Chinese dramas my sister and our cousins loved. Smoke rising from the fallen houses, the bodies of the horses, men, women, and children scattered across the dirt road, bleeding and still, fallen flags trampled into wet dirt. What if my sister were killed? I was about to tell my mother about the secret mission when I saw Ong. She was wet, and she carried a plastic bag of greens. She leaned it quietly by the doorway. Before anyone noticed, she left. I followed. Ong, where's De? Hurt. I blinked the tears away. What happened? Many were injured. The two of us ran behind the corn husk shack. My heart pounded with each step. I saw my sister lying on the dusty earth, her head on Master May's lap. There was a wound at the side of her forehead. Blood ran down her face. Another cousin was also on the ground. His foot was wrapped in an old shirt. Ong Yao, Grandma's coming. The children scrambled. By the time Grandma arrived with the switch in her hand, her head shaking left and right, the line of her mouth tight, only the fallen ones remained, with Master May now on his knees. Most of the group had been caught when they scattered. There was not much talk. No one wanted to attract the attention of the guards. Grandma's switch flew into butts. Whimpers and yelps were caught in throats. Master May suffered the worst of the consequences. Grandma said, you are the oldest. You could have killed them all. If the authorities find out, what would happen? So for lunch that day, 
the younger children and I ate fresh morning glory. The greens were fried with garlic oil and seasoned with fish sauce. I can still hear the crunch of the stalks and taste how the oil made the rice slippery, how the garlic made all of it slightly sweet. None of the children in the group chose to enjoy the meal with us. They watched us clear our plates. It was our first taste of freedom. Before lunch, the group had been naughty children playing a game, but after the meal, all of us saw that they were brave and powerful. I knew the adults had all survived the war, but I had never imagined we children could be warriors. Long before we left Bun Vinai refugee camp, the Yang warriors showed us what existed beyond the fence and gave us the courage we needed to leave. I see them now far away from that dry, dusty, hungry place we shared beneath the burning sun, the group of warriors standing strong. Master May, firm belly forward, Ong on her tiptoes, trying to be older than her years. Do, chin held high, her stronger leg braced against the earth. They were my heroes, not the characters in the movies, and they are glorious in the sun of my youth. Thank you so much, Billy, for reading that wonderful book. I One thing you're gonna get at Bus with is a memory. Um, so without further ado, um, I want to start asking some questions. I just um, had some, uh, and one of the ones that I had, and you know, Billy, you can answer this, and Kalia, when Kalia jumps back on, she can also um, answer, but sure. uh, so I was noticing throughout the entire book you know, um, there's mentions of violence, mentions of incidents that happened to the children. Um, but I was wondering, what, what, what does it mean to represent and illustrate, you know, trauma and violence? You know, what, what? Because that's an, I, I figure it's an intentional move to not represent, you know, the perpetrators or the violent act that takes place that leaves one of the children injured. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I was just really wondering, you know, what are the questions that we're asking when we represent violence or don't represent violence. Sure. So I can take this question and then uh, Kali can jump in. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, after when I read the manuscript for this story, it's obvious that I, I knew that there's going to be trauma, there's going to be mm -hmm. violence. And, you know, I, I read on the, on the history of the Hmong people. And uh, let me tell you, the history of the Hmong people is filled with violence violence, um, just deaths. And, you know, I think it was during the Qin dynasty that um, even the Emperor Qin proclaimed that, you know, the Hmong people were to be exterminated. So the Hmong people were very close to extermination. You know, so throughout history, it's filled with violence and trauma. And today, I believe that today, many of our grandparents and parents are still traumatized. However, because this book is a, it's a children's book, and I don't want to uh, overwhelm the readers, such as the parents or the children. So what my job as an illustrator is to, I want it to be subtle with it. And how I can be subtle with the trauma and violence is to use as an illustrator, my elements, the elements of art, the principles of design. How can I use proportion? How can I use space? How can I use color to bring those trauma in? And so as you look through the story, you are seeing subtle hidden messages that I am trying to portray by using space, uh, the back view of the characters. In fact, the point of seeing in this story, why you're not seeing the faces of the children, but you're seeing the back view of those children is because what I was trying to portray is that, you know what, Hmong people from 5,000 years have not had a voice. You know, they were seen as vile. They were seen as barbaric. They don't have a voice. They're always, they're always dreaming of having a voice, of finding a way to keep moving forward no matter what. And so what I was trying to do was, I was trying to show these characters just their back to let the readers, the audience know that we're not gonna see their faces at all. That is an implication of saying that we don't hear their voices. However, though, I was trying to show their actions, how they move, 
um, how they act because it is through action, it is through taking initiation of surviving that I try to portray. And so if you're asking me of trauma or violence, it is through space, it is through time of the art, it is through the shadows, it is through the back views of it. Thank you so much, Billy, for answering that. Um, I wanna to pivot to Kalia and I'll have a few comments to add on, but Kalia, let's hear from you. Thank you, Kevin, and thank you, Billy, for being, being my hero tonight as my technology has been wavering. You've been wonderful, so thank you. You know, I appreciate this question, and I appreciate it so much because from an internal lens, and that is always the lens that I'm working from, I'm, I'm writing first for those who would understand before I try to speak to those who won't. You know, for me, everything I write is a love letter to someone somewhere, and in this case, it's very much a love letter to the Yang warriors. and so. Everything that I wrote up came from a space of love. With that aside, I also want to say, you know, I was a kid born in that place, surrounded by violence. I knew gentleness and love, you know, through through the words of my father, who's a song poet in the Hmong tradition, through the gentle hands of my mother, the steadfast attention of the adults around me, and even the children around me. And I wanted to communicate that in the work. That has always been more important to who I am as a human being than the traumas that were coming from the outside world. And so I was very cognizant of that in the writing period, in the writing process. I wanted to honor first the world that made me whole before I would tackle the edges of brokenness around us. And I think that was something that I thought carefully about in the writing of this book particularly because it is Yang warriors. And when people look at me, nobody would say Kalia is a warrior at all. I'm so gentle in my speech, in my interactions with the world. And I am made this way through the love above and beyond any kind of violence. And so I wanted to honor this truth. Thank you so much. I, I, I truly believe you've honored that truth. I mean, just hearing you both talk about um, how you both wanted to represent the violence and trauma. I mean, Billy, hearing you talk about space and how you use color and you use, you know, the movement of the children to demonstrate all of this. I mean, reading it and watching it, you get a sense of how dynamic it, it truly is. There's never a page where you don't see and can, and can almost hear them just kind of moving, even the running. And I, I can hear it all, the flip flops hitting the ground. And Kalia, you're absolutely right. You know, there's um, when it comes to trauma, when it comes to violence, you have to um, you have to always be thinking about like how it's represented and what it does. Um, and I think I want to follow this thread and just um, kind of ask a second question around, um, you know, what was the process like um, and illustrating in terms of like healing? Was there uh, a, a sense of release? Was it cathartic in a way to? you know, put this into this format and, you know, intentionally uh, bringing it to life in the children's book. This particular story, and, you know, Kalia, you can answer and Billy, we can pivot to you, but I'd love to hear from both of you how it was. That's such a good question, Kevin. So, so on this question of healing, it's interesting because um, obviously I wasn't one of the Yang warriors and yet I wrote up their story. You know, the first time that my sister got a copy of the book and she was a Yang warrior, she just, she couldn't believe it. But what was more incredible were the reactions of her kids. They looked at her, you know, she has a scar right here. They, they had no idea, you know, the story of origin, where the scar came from and why it's on their mother's face. But they, they read through the book and then they looked at her and she said her, her youngest put her hand up and, and, and wiped away her hair, tenderly kissed the scar. For me, the healing always was the hope that when these Yang warriors saw this book in the world, that they would understand the magnitude of, those, of, of that real life story of that adventure to forage for greens, how that is not only, you know, channel the heart of this writer, but how it will continue its work long after these years have passed. That the story that they exemplified for me, the heroes that they were for all of us in that place, it was real and it wasn't just there and then. It will not be forgotten like refugee camps across the world. You know, structures meant, you know, not to stand, to, to fall in the test of time, but that these stories will live on perhaps even after we're gone. So the hope beyond just me, Kevin, was always for these gang warriors and then their children and children everywhere. Thank you so much, Kalia. And Billy, I'll pivot to you. 
Uh, Kevin, that is a wonderful question. So for me, um, you know, in the illustrator note, I wrote that So I am a Hmong American, and um, I was raised in Minnesota. And as I said in my note, I was not born in a refugee camp. I was not born in Laos or Thailand. I was born in St. Paul. And, you know, and I, I grew up in uh, Minnesota. I, you know, I graduated from Washington County to the University of uh, Wisconsin River Falls. And so I've never witnessed it. I've never witnessed a war, never witnessed what it's like to leave families behind, uh, what it's like to cross the Mekong River, you know. And so having just that American culture within me, I don't know my own heritage before uh, Yang Warriors. I, I never knew. And so when Kalia and our editor, Eric Anderson, asked me to illustrate this wonderful story, I read it and instantly I knew I wanted it. I wanted this story. Like I told them, like, you know what? I want this story. This is going to be mine. And so as I did a lot of research on it, I started to feel very uh, intrigued. I think something was it, within me was coming out. And I even uh, I even sent an email to Kalia, telling Kalia, Kalia, you did something for me. It really opened me up. It really helped me to find out who I am as a Hmong person. And so what is healing for me is that after reading the history of the Hmong people, watching videos, movies, just understanding our own heritage, our culture. What, what omitted from me was um, a sense of resilience, a sense of recuperating, knowing that, you know what, our ancestors fought hard. They fought for 5,000 years. 5,000 years, there were so many proclamations that the Hmong people were to be exterminated. They're not going to exist. They're going to be extinct. But yet here we are here now uh, with Kali and me, with uh, Senator Fung Her in, uh, in Minnesota. We're still here today. And that is what is so healing because it allowed me to know that our ancestors fought hard. They fought with hope. They fought with resilience, persistence. And so knowing that allows me to realize that life cannot overwhelm me or it cannot push me down. And therefore I will always stand back up. And that is the, that is the idea that I wanted to illustrate within this book to show that with the children that, you know what, the children can do it too. They're very resilient, they're very hopeful, and they're very tenacious. You know, one more thing that I'll add um, that, that that has been particularly, I think, healing for, for, for this artist's heart is I'm 40 years old. I've been doing this since I was 22, pursuing this writer's journey. And it's incredible when you're at a point in your career where an editor, a press, like the University of Minnesota Press will say, who do you want to illustrate your book? And I can be in a position where I, I can say, I want to introduce to Literary America Hmong, Hmong illustrators. I want to open the door as wide as I can to be in a position where I can say that and to look to a community. You know, I saw Billy's art first on social media and to say, you know, would you be interested? That has been an incredibly empowering experience for me as a writer and as an artist, as a member of American publishing, but also world publishing. I know talent exists across our communities. The, the, the trick is how do we open those doorways? And that's what this book allowed me to continue to do, um, an important part of my work, my bigger work beyond this book, but of course, as a part of this journey as well. Yes, I, I, hearing you both, I, I, um, you can, well, this is what I was hearing, you know, this idea of how trauma is carried through the history, you know, there's the weight of history and everything. And Billy, you know, it sounds like from your experience and how you were talking about it, um, once you went through the process of researching and illustrating, that's what, you know, really hit it was the, that history has a way of surfacing. There's just, you know, in uh, surprising ways. Um, and Kalia, when I heard you talk about how your sister, you know, and her children, you know, kind of recognized where the scar came from, where it originated, and just that kind of legacy and what it does to recognize these things. I think, and this will, we can lead into the next question, um, but kind of how this story is also one about ghosts. You know, there are ghosts that haunt us, the ghosts of history that appear just throughout our lives, you know, 
whether it's through illustration or through trying to put some an experience that we hold dear into some sort of format. Um, and so this question is um, about ghosts and it's the ghosts beyond the fence who lingered around the refugee camp. Um, they really stayed with, with us. Um, what role do ghosts play in Hmong culture and more? And I, I can, uh, Kalia, you can start. You know, I, I grew up in a scary place full of scary forces, but among all of my fears, it wasn't, it was never just centered on the things I could see. It was so much that I couldn't see. Ghosts have been for me, um, this, of course, this incredible entertainment when you're, when you, when you're a refugee kid in a camp where you can't go to school, where your people get food three days a week, to be able to understand that you live a wor in a world that is bigger than the things you can see is perhaps the most empowering truth of this ghost narrative. And in the American context, Kevin, once we came to America, I knew we were haunted by so much. Poverty, racism, racism in my case, genderism, and so many other things. And so the goals were never just imagined. They were the world around me. So often I was interfacing with a world that couldn't see these things at work, but I knew them to be there, which resonated so deeply for this Hmong American heart. Then there's a simple truth. Every Hmong person I know has a ghost story to tell, and every Hmong person I know can tell like no one else. So from the beginnings of my career, I wanted to honor this fact. In the late homecomer, I talked about the haunted Section A house, haunted to us, but also to all the families that moved in and moved out after us. I would, you know, it would it would turn out to be, and and that will continue to be a a, a strong I think thread across my, the body of my work because I want to honor these truths that perhaps challenge the structures of, of American literature as we know it to be. Um, I think that a writer doesn't just become simply because we have stories to tell. We become so that we can make room for others to inhabit the spaces where we are. And for me, the ghosts, it, they, they are that very real possibility. But I will be the first person to say, I believe in ghosts. I live in a world where I sometimes see them in the spaces where other people don't. And those experiences are real and legitimate and they deserve a voice in literature. And so ghosts, oh, any day, any day. Billy? So I am the opposite of Kalia, actually. So I am the opposite, um, again, because I myself, I have never seen a ghost, you know, but but of course, when you hear a ghost story, you can't help but to have that chill, the hair stand on your neck, though. And yet we share, we all share that, you know, as um, Lovecraft, H.P. Lovecraft once said, you know, the only the fear that we face is the unknown. But you know what? With this story, though, I decided that I wanted to portray this differently, maybe philosophically. And so when we look at the illustration and, you know, just before I go on, how my process work with art is that I usually have the idea and the vision, but I don't put all my energy into it. I, I just do it, like imp I improvise it. I let things come. I let the work tell me what I should and should not do. And, that, and that's how it works because that's how I find what this story is trying to tell. So initially, when Kalia and I looked at that um, that particular illustration, she wanted to have a, a shaman, you know. But for me, I I wanted to go with my instinct that we should have the ghosts. And after we finished the book, and the book came out, and I looked at that illustration again, what I soon saw within that illustration, there was an irony. The irony is that there are the ghosts behind the fence; they're outside the camp, and yet they are yearning to come into the camp because they fear loneliness, they fear being left alone. Whereas the children who are inside the camp are trying to leave the camp to forage for greens. And so we're seeing a duality between life and death. We're seeing a duality between light and dark, two opposites. But maybe what I tried to figure out was that I was just looking at these lonely ghosts. These ghosts are just shadows. And that's what played the that's the theme of this whole story. That's the theme of the illustrations of the shadows of the children, is that you're seeing the shadows of the will, the wills of the children. How how long can they hold on before that shadow leaves them and goes behind that fence? 
In fact, if you look at another illustration, the illustration of um, Kalia's character when she woke up and she's standing by the door looking outside and the children wasn't there. And you realize that her shadow wasn't even there. And that's because her shadow is very weak. Her shadow is leaving. It's going to be leaving soon and they need the food now. And so we're playing with just light and dark again. As I said, we're playing with contrast. I'm using the elements of art to bring that to life, to play with the big idea of life and death, which again, like I said, I try to keep it subtle as much as possible. But you know, but speaking through here, that's what I try to, um, to explain, that the real ghost is just that shadow of us, that will of us. And if we can't hold on any longer, it's gonna leave us. And so the only thing we can do is to keep pushing forward and do what we can to keep that shuttle with us as much as possible. Really such beautiful statements from both of you. I mean, I, I like look back, Dilly, the minute you mentioned that the, go the shadow is not there and I had to, I went, I went back and there was like a little Easter egg. I was like, oh my God, there's, there's an incredible amount of detail that's just lurking and, you know, in plain sight, but it's, it's, it's wonderful hearing you both talk about, you know, Kalia with ghosts and how you believe in them and Billy, you know, this reconciling almost of beliefs and ghosts and shadows and the interplay between them. I, it's just, it's fantastic to hear you both speak on like such a, like a one, a question that like, um, well, this idea of ghosts as possibility, um, I, you know, they've kind of always seen as uh, these kind of the, persistence of ruins or persistence of memory, but um, Kalia, how you have talked about them, I just, I, they have, they've, they've almost changed, you know, just completely transformed in meaning um, and what they can hold. And I just, I really appreciate that. And just that answer and you too, Billy, really great. Um, I don't know if um, we have time for one more question, um, but Kalia or Billy, how you feel about that. But if, if you, um, if you'd like, we can, we can um, end with just one more question. Would that be okay? Okay, great. Um, so this is kind of about, kind of a pivot away, but I think we can bring it back. Um, you know, the last scene or one of the last scenes is one where there's a table and people are eating. Um, and not only that, they're eating, you know, uh, this like the foraged food. And I've been thinking a lot about foraged food. There's a, recent children's book that came out called Watercress by an incredible author. Yeah, and if you if no one's read it here, please pick it up. It's an incredible book about the how food transforms us and can be so transformative, can be found, you know, in just crevices. And um, but aside from that, you know, that moment for me, that's when, you know, they kind of she kind of realizes that the warriors were not just playing games. You know, they were brave, they were strong. They were, um, despite what someone might uh, see as like a disability, they, they, they were, they had the, you know, these mental battles. And I think that, I think just wanted to highlight just kind of the, the weight that food carries, why it's so powerful in this. You know, I also um, love cilantro. Uh, and I just found all those scenes describing the cilantro and the green onion just really amazing and just really um, great. So I just, I'd love to hear, you know, that about that scene and how it came together. I love that you brought up Watercress by my friend Andrea Wang. It's an incredible book, a beautiful gift to all of us who, who, who love beautifully illustrated and beautifully told stories. Um, that are meaningful. I think food in the Hmong American context has been particularly critical because of the war in Southeast Asia. Because when the war came, Laos was the most heavily bombed nation in the world, although the world didn't know it. My parents grew up in Sing Kwang, the most heavily bombed province of Laos. And so farming became an impossibility. They were in the last years of the war reliant on rice drops from the, from the US to survive. Even as the US was bombing the country and killing everybody, there were these rice drops. You know, Billy talks about irony, and that is one of the great ironies of that war. And so they, so in the years in the jungle, there were no more rice drops. And that's really where the Hmong knew hunger in a way that we'd never known it before. Um, in the camps of Thailand, we got rations three days a week. We were expected to survive up and, and to wait out the years because Thailand was practicing a humane deterrence policy 
They didn't want more Hmong people coming into the camp. They didn't want Hmong people to tell other Hmong people that there might be food there. So food is incredible in terms of the politics of peoplehood and, and just life in general. But when I think about that scene, I can still taste the, the crunchiness, the slight sweetness, the saltiness, Kevin. And that is how food writes on memory. You know, every time I see watercress, every time I eat it, or morning glory in my case, I think immediately about that meal. And what I ate that meal wasn't just, you know, greens that would nourish my body. It was a spirit of adventure, this idea that we could cause good trouble. The idea, the emergence of the good trouble, I think really was born in that moment for me, that sometimes we have to risk our lives to break the rules for something better. That each and every single one of us, that we can afford to, that we have within us the courage to carry, take care of others, others who are weaker, others who are younger, others who might need us, even though they don't know it. And so, yeah, for me, that scene had to be the way it was. Billy, what about you from the illustrator's perspective? How did you, how did you come to that scene? Sure. So, you know, to be honest, I think that scene was just a typical scene, you know, just, uh, just another scene. You know, I never really looked at food that way until, uh, the, the, until you asked the question, Kevin. But, you know, if I think about it too, though, and again, like, as I said, I, I was born Amer in America. You know, I don't know that experience. I don't know the experience of what my parents or my grandparents or anyone had to go through just to survive. You know, and living in America, we can just look at cereal or rice now just as just a typical food. You know, we can just wake up, wake up and just say, yeah, I don't want to eat rice. I don't want to eat cereal. But you know what? In a third world country, for those who have to survive, to them, it's important. You know, when I look at that illustration now, I think I look at food, I look at food as a reminder, you know, a reminder for freedom, a reminder for the future. You know, these children did not fight for food. What they were fighting for is to keep it moving forward, you know, keep it moving forward as much as possible because food provide, provides nourishment. It provides us recuperation and we need that to keep going. You know, and so when I look at food now, I just see that it's just a reminder that we should not take things for granted. Life should not be taken for granted. We have to look at things analytically and realize that, you know, in other countries, people are fighting for it. People are fighting for food, for freedom, you know, just to be happy. Everyone is fighting. And so when I look at food, I think that's what I think about. I think about the, um, the goals that other people are struggling to strive for. You know? Okay, um, thank you so much, Billy and Kalia. I mean, just one more uh, comment about the pro about you both. You know, Billy, it sounds like the task of the illustrator is enormous to have to translate these experiences through drawings despite not having firsthand experience. And then Kalia to, you know, entrust with these memories to someone and to an illustrator and make sure that, you know, what's on the page is, you know, an accurate representation or at least close to. And it seems like you two just had this wonderful partnership that allowed for such a beautiful book to come together. Um, thank you so much for answering these questions. I've seen the comments that people are really enjoying all these little details that are coming out. Um, and I'm just gonna pass it out now to um, Lori, just so we can wrap up here. Thank you, thank you. Thank you all so much. I, you didn't get to see me, but the entire time I was just sitting here snapping and like getting a little teary eyed. So thank you all so much for joining us this evening. And I want to say a special thank you to everyone who joined us either through Facebook or YouTube. We have really just appreciated you guys joining us for our first program in, gosh, just about a little over a year. So thank you all so much. Again, I can't express enough how much I love Yang Warriors and how much the illustrations and everything spoke to me. And I love that we ended with food. That just was such a pivotal part. and. You guys speaking on it just made my little heart sing. So thank you all. And now we're going to go ahead and say our goodbyes. Thank you all so much for 
showing up and coming up. If you wanted to order the books, you can go ahead and email books at busboysandpoets.com and we'll go ahead and set that up for you guys. Shipping is available to anywhere in the United States and the books will be signed by both Talia and Billy. And now we're gonna go ahead and show Billy's video again and we'll, fingers crossed this time, it plays nice and smooth and that will be our goodbye. Thank you all so much and follow us and at Busboys and Poets on Facebook, Instagram, and uh, Twitter, so you can keep up with us and see what we've got next. My journey began here at the Ban Vinai refugee camp in Thailand. Center for Hmong Studies at Concordia University, St. Paul introduced me to these magnificent photos. Because I was not born or been to the refugee camp, I don't know what life was like there. And also, it was closed in 1992. So I had to use my imagination I imagined what the earth would feel like beneath my feet, the hot weather on my skin, the orange dust that enters my nostrils and exits black, and what it's like to be a fierce and brave child within the camp. The next step I took was to read. I read a lot of books. I read books that gave me inspirations. I read on the Hmong history, I read biographies, I read fictions, and of course, I read children's books. In addition, I found inspiration from the old masters like Caspar David Friedrich, Gustave Courbet, Tyrus Wong, and Bandao, a traditional Hmong textile art found within the Hmong culture. With the assistance from the University of Minnesota Press editor Eric Anderson, I created a storyboard and a book dummy to get a sense of the rhythm and emotion of the story. I created some watercolor concepts and I explored the interior and the exterior of the camp. I made a lot of sketches of people, animals, trees. I played with colors and I designed characters, making sure the clothes they wore and the hairstyle fits that particular period because I want to be truthful to the story. Once I felt confident and prepared, I began the illustrations. Every night I took notes and looked over my illustrations. Sometimes, if I need help, my nephew Owen helps by being my model. For a particular illustration, I would make sketches over and over until I felt comfortable or the result I visioned is right. Then, I'd finalize the illustration. Within this journey, the Yang warriors demonstrated many valuable traits of a warrior. They showed me heroism, bravery, sacrifice, persistence, compassion, and hope. The Yang warriors showed me that resilience is not only standing back up after you fall, but returning to the state of mindfulness. Not looking back into the past, nor forward into the future, but concentrating on what is important right in front of you. It can be anything. For me, it was you. <laughs> 